Good afternoon, I'm uh, George Bruno, and uh, I work for the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, and a lot of people refer to us as APHIS, and uh, APHIS is divided into a number of different program units, and the program uh, Larry and I work for is plant protection and quarantine, so we mainly deal with plant health issues, uh, we do general trapping, uh, a lot of pest surveys in the state, and including grasshopper survey and grasshopper uh, management. So, uh, grasshoppers, as Trevor said, have been on the rise uh, across eastern Washington for the last uh, few years, and we're kind of in a dry cycle, and, uh, and, and uh, grasshoppers are really limited by weather. So, when you have, uh, in, in the spring weather, plays a key role in um, how severe outbreaks are every year. And uh, so the, the, the dry weather we've had over the past uh, four or five years has really caused a lot of problems uh, throughout not just Ferry County and Okanagan County, but also uh, most of Eastern Washington, different counties. So we get a lot of complaints from uh, different land managers, private individuals like yourselves, and uh, a lot of people ask us, you know, when are we going to get some relief from the grasshoppers? And we just tell them, really, the, the best thing to expect is, is once, since spring weather, if, if it's dry with little rain volume, you're going to have grasshopper problems. That's just, and, it, and especially if the dry weather extends out in, into the summer, um, you're going to have grasshoppers every year. And so hopefully, that weather pattern changes and we start getting cool, you know, rainy weather in the spring, and that will take a, a heavy toll on the grasshopper populations, and and uh, eventually the populations will crash. So that's the best I can tell you what's going to happen in the next, uh, you know, in the next year. And then let me introduce uh, Larry Skillstead. Uh, he's our long-term uh, grasshopper guru. He's been. Introduce yourself, Mark. Yeah, uh, I'm actually a retired science teacher, uh, but I started working with USDA in 1976, and that's a long time before some of you were <laughs> But uh, yeah, the, the job kind of fit hand in glove, so to speak. I would finish teaching school on a Thursday or Friday in early June, and I'd switch hats, and on Monday I'd go to work with the USDA and primarily work on grasshopper survey and Mormon cricket, other rangeland pests. So I thought uh, it would be helpful for, uh, especially for you landowners and, and growers, to uh, go over some general biology and, and uh, habits of grasshoppers and uh, talk about some of the common grasshoppers that we have in the area that we find here and also the life cycle. So Larry and I are going to tag team on this uh, little talk. And, and also, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the treatment options and the different chemicals that are available for uh, controlling and managing grasshoppers. Uh, this is uh, an example of our 2014 adult grasshopper survey in Washington last year. And uh, you, know, you can see all the, the red bars the, that by the red dots, that there's a lot of uh, economic uh, areas throughout Washington, not just here in, in Ferry, Okanagan, Stevens County, but elsewhere. And uh, so I kind of narrowed down the, the, the infestation map to just show uh, Okanagan and Ferry County. And so each one of those dots represents an actual survey stop that our grasshoppers scouts made last year. And the legend down in the lower left-hand corner, and that's the grasshopper densities or the grasshoppers per square yard that we found at those locations. So all the red and the yellow uh, dots represent, you know, the, the, the yellow is 8 to 15, or 8 to 14 per square yard, and the red dots are above, above that. So um, one of the responsibilities of our agency, USDA, is to conduct rangeland grasshopper surveys uh, in all the western <coughs> states. And so here in Washington, we have grasshopper scouts that go out in the spring and, and uh, during the summer and make these kind of stops. And that helps to identify some of the problem areas that we have 
throughout the, the state. And so just by the looks of it, there's a lot of uh, issues going on uh, around, uh, around uh, these counties. <coughs> This is a, just kind of a snapshot of the national picture. Um, every, every state west of the, the Mississippi, um, and there are 17 western states, are involved in some type of a, a, a yearly survey. And so Washington up there, and, and, and so this kind of gives us an idea of, of what to expect the following year. So uh, we have a lot of uh, areas in, in Eastern Washington in the 8 to 15 per square yard. Then you look at down there in, the, in some of the red areas in northern Texas and western Oklahoma, and you know they're really having some grasshopper problems, and, and that's mainly due to the drought conditions that occur in, in those states. Um, I thought I'd throw in a couple old pictures of how treatments were done back in the in the early part of the last century, they'd have crews that would go um, through these uh, alfalfa fields, dusting crickets and grasshoppers, and um, it's, it's some uh, really neat kind of old slides of, of how things were done back then. What are they dusting them with? Um, it's, it's, uh, they were using either sodium arsenic or sodium flosilicate. So, and you can see that these ranchers here, they're dusting, uh, you know, just uh, hand spreading the bait, um, you know, with uh, five gallon buckets. They're not wearing any gloves, and, and so they're, uh, they're just walking in, in line and, and, and throwing out this bait. And so I'm uh, laughing, get a little laugh at Larry's expense here, but this is, uh, if you look at this, this picture, you can see that they didn't really have much uh, health, uh, any health concerns here. Their faces were caked with dust. They were, they were, uh, they weren't wearing any kind of protective equipment, and they were walking through, uh, just dusting these uh, with these hand dusters. And now we have a lot more high-tech compounds, and and uh, we definitely have more concerns about health and safety than we. Back then. They are wearing aprons probably to protect their clothing, and that was what they're probably mainly concerned about. And this is an example, it's an old photograph of a Mormon cricket trench. Crews would come in and dig these trenches, and, and uh, they, they would uh, build the trenches around a Mormon cricket infestation, and then the crickets would march into these trenches and move in either direction. And every so often, like you see at the bottom of the slide, they would dig a three-foot three pit. And the crickets would go in, and then they would pour diesel oil or kerosene oil on them and burn them. And then you'd have crews that would scoop shovel the, the carcasses onto flatbed trucks and haul them, and haul them away. So. So, just a few interesting facts about uh, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are economically important in 17 western states. And there's about a dozen pest species out of uh, more than 450 that uh, cause most of the damage. In Washington here, we have six of those species. And they annually, annually remove about 20 to 22% of the rangeland vegetation. And an estimated average loss of four hundred million dollars a year. So here are the six species that we have in uh, the, the main problem with within Washington. And uh, the number one uh, grasshopper, migratory grasshopper, and the number three one, clear wing grasshopper, Candula pellucida. Those are the two grasshoppers that are the main culprits for most of the problems you guys are facing here. And the other grasshoppers are present here, but at a lesser, at a lesser extent. So uh, now I'll let Larry uh, talk a little bit about the, the uh, grasshopper biology. As you can see, uh, one generation per year, nipple stage, uh, normally 30 to 40 days, duration of the adult. 40 to 60, they lay mostly in the soil, generally in the top one inch of soil, but occasionally they will 
lay their eggs in a tuft of bunch grass right toward the top of the bunch grass. Uh, one to four egg pods per female. Some of these will actually have six to eight pods of eggs and 40 to 80 eggs per pod. Forty so, or four. Four to eighty. So uh, if you had the, the worst extent, uh, if they had six six pods with eighty eggs in each pod, four hundred and eighty. Now we're talking about eight grasshoppers per square yard. If we presume half of them are male, half of them are female. So we take the four females that are capable of laying 500 eggs, you have 2,000 eggs in a square yard. Okay? So when we see 40 and 50 grasshoppers per square yard, and we say, wow, that is really an infestation. But have all of the eggs successfully hatched and survived, it could be much, much worse than it is. And that's, that's not very much consolation on it. So basically... So, so what's the survival? Is there a range of an average survival rate? Well, 10 to 20 percent? Yeah, about uh, 10 to 20 percent. And again, it depends so much on the climate and, and each year, moisture and alternating heat, cold, moist, dry, if you get that early in the season, it will uh, certainly benefit by reducing the numbers. So we see that they, they mate and probably start mating in late July on into uh, August. The uh, female extends her abdomen and with this pool depositor, she will actually dig right down through the soil, extend the abdomen, and hope for that. Okay. So then she retracts that abdomen and covers up that little nest here. Generally about an inch of eggs there in those pods. And so this female can lay four to five to six different pods uh, in each situation. The adult then will die. Primarily it will die after the first killing frost. They may survive all the way through September, early October, depending on, uh, on the year. So now we see the egg pod down here covered by dirt, and they overwinter in that egg pod. It does not seem to make much difference whether the temperature gets to 30 below zero or if it never drops below zero. They, they seem to have a pretty good insulation there, and so it doesn't really affect uh, the survival of those eggs. The eggs will then start hatching from the top of the pod, as we enumerated, as this start, the ground starts warming up, that series of eggs will hatch, then this one, then this one, so they go through that particular sequence. So nature has provided them with an excellent survival rate. So these grasshoppers have been around the world for many, many, many years. The first uh, level of eggs that hatch develop into a nymph. Now the difference between, you might think about complete metamorphosis and incomplete metamorphosis. That means a change in form. So when these hatch, they look like miniature grasshoppers. Whereas butterflies lay their eggs, and the eggs hatch into a larvae. The larvae forms a cocoon or a chrysalis. And uh, they go through from a crawling insect to a flying insect. So it's a complete change in body form. This is incomplete that they start looking like a grasshopper, and each one of these molts, as they grow, they will break out of their exoskeleton and become slightly larger. And these particular steps are known as instars. 
So when you read some of the chemical labels, they might say <coughs> recommended the best to treat when the grasshoppers uh, <coughs> are between the second and fourth instars. Okay, second and fourth instar. And particularly those like Dibelin that is a uh, growth regulator. And uh, George will explain that with uh, this particular uh, follow-up here. Each time they get a little larger and the wing pads start to develop. After they reach the fifth instar, their final molt, they will break out of that exoskeleton and they are flying adults. They will not change anymore after that. They don't go through any further molt. And that's when most people start recognizing, whoa, we got grasshoppers out here. It's when they're flying, or they're up on the road, or they're hitting your windshield, and so on. By that time, it's almost too late to do much about it. Okay. George mentioned uh, the clear wing grasshopper can be a little pellucida. I've actually watched these hatch out of the ground on the side of uh, a road borrow pit, and they look like salt and pepper popping out of the ground. They're just black and white. And they go through, the numbers are kind of vague here, one, two, three, four, fifth instar, and then as they mature, become more uh, adults, they become kind of a yellowish color. These are identified by the mottled wing pads, and the back of the pronotum here comes back at a 90 degree angle. Uh, they will come together in masses to lay their eggs. Uh, and you get into the mountain areas, and you see a little patch of green grass, looks like it's been mowed. Who had their lawnmower out here? Look. And you start looking. Literally thousands of Camellia pellucida in that particular area. Okay? Uh, females are almost twice as large as the males. Uh, you can see their dark brown is gray and they turn bright yellow as they mature. Okay? Next to them. It's still a clear wing. It's an early hatching species, one of the first ones in our area. Uh, when you're out there and all of a sudden you see something moving on the ground. And they're generally, you know, an eighth to a quarter of an inch long. They're very tiny. You see they uh, start uh, hatching at various uh, temperatures, moisture, and so on. And we chatted about that a little earlier. There you can see Camula inserting that ovipositor and extending the abdomen down to lay the eggs. This is a Mormon cricket, and we do have a few here in Perry County, um, up around O'Brien Creek and off uh, to the north of that. I have found uh, Mormon crickets. Also. Uh, north of Curlew Lake and up on the west side and the hillsides there, I've seen Mormon crickets. And uh, I'm not sure if there's any over around Wakanda or not. Okay, next. This is the other one that is a predominant species here, Melanopus sanguinopes. It's called a migratory grasshopper because from time to time, they will amass populations where they feed voraciously. They start losing subsistence there, so they will up and fly. And uh, sometimes they fly 100 feet off the ground, other times 1,000 feet off the ground. So one of our techniques that we uh, learn about in our adult grasshopper survey he said, uh, when you're out there, you're looking for grasshoppers, 
Don't only look at the ground, but take your notebook and shade the sun. And if the sun, if they're migrating, the sun will be shining through their wings, and it'll be just glistening up there, just uh, like a thousand little strobe lights up there. Uh, so they'll fly 100 to 100 feet off the ground. You don't mean elevation. Elevation. And then distances, there have been records where it's over 300 miles. But generally, those are pretty rare back in the uh, decibel uh, era. Uh, we do not see Melanopus sanguinepes migrating much in Washington. And if they do, it's maybe two or three miles. Okay. So it's, it's pretty minimal as far as distance that they fly. And that's only when the area they're living in becomes short of food? That's generally what motivates them. And only the adult grasshoppers are capable of flying. So you can see the, the wings there as they're growing through the different stages of development. Their wing pads are growing, but they're, right. they only actually fly when they're adults. <clears throat> There's a variety of ways to check the, the species, and we're not overly concerned about you learning the species other than to recognize them. But here, the back of the pernodum is fairly rounded. There's not that much modeling on the outer leaves. Our wings, leaves. The new plants here, uh, and then we've got. This is a female ovipositor here. This is a male right here, and uh, one of the identifying characteristics is it has a little dimple right in the center of that uh, subgenital plate. So uh, that's the migratory. How much do they eat? Eat about its own weight each day. <clears throat> and as you can see, that they love the green stuff. And if you're talking about harvestable crops, not hay, I know they do attack your alfalfa. They Generally on wheat, or oats, or barley, any of the grains, as they ripen, the leaves start drying out, and they get brown or tan in color. And right below the head, there's a little constriction right there. It's the last part that is green. The last little part on the lower part of the head. And so if there's grasshoppers in that wheat field or food field, that's where they will feed, and all of a sudden, that head of wheat drops to the ground. You can't pick it up with a combine. So that's, you know, they, they reduce the production by uh, eliminating the productivity of the leaves and so on, and then it's kind of like a coup de grace, the last thing. We will knock the head right off. They, they can be nasty, nasty critters. Okay, we talked about the low normal spring, soil temperature, uh, and winter causing uh, egg mortality, uh, epizootics. Uh, if you're out in an area, and I've seen some, again, up on the north end of uh, Curlew Lake, you look out there on some tall grass, and there's a grasshopper just clinging onto that stem. And you go up there, and it doesn't fly away. <clears throat> and it's been killed by this fungal pathogen, the Mugafra grilli. And uh, it's kind of interesting to see it. And uh, so you just wonder how many. You know, if you see one up on that plant that's dead, how many others has it killed? Now, extreme drought. 
And we were talking about drought conditions earlier that promotes grasshopper populations. Extreme drought, you know, affects all of the plants. The plants are not uh, maintaining any moisture. And uh, like all living things, they need water to survive. There's some natural enemies, of course, the robber fly. If you've been out walking around the field or just stop and listen, and you'll hear something like a bee. And you, you know, you don't want to get stung by a bee, but if you look closely, you'll see these robber flies out there. And they are excellent, excellent predators. They will, uh, if you're real patient, you take a little bit of a step toward them and you flush a couple of grasshoppers up. Every once in a while you'll see that zoop and nail a grasshopper. And they will you'll get them right behind the, uh, the head. And uh, it just, it's like a guided missile hitting one of those. So more are swatting flies. <laughs> well, house flies, you can swap all those you want. <laughs> These, these little robber flies are uh, yeah. really... Isn't there, I just saw an article about a gold digger ant or gold digger bee or that was a predator of grasshoppers. It was a good bug you wanted yes. to have in your yes. garden to eat uh, grasshoppers. Uh, <clears throat> gold digger. I don't think, yeah, and I don't think we have a picture of this one. That, uh, that little uh, fly kind of remember it, but it is kind of gold and it's fuzzy. Yeah. And they will watch a grasshopper lay their eight. And as soon as the grasshopper retracts out of that eight pod hole, they will come in right behind it and lay an egg. And that fly egg will develop into a larvae. And that and larvae feeds, feeds, feeds on the grasshopper eggs. Yeah. They're called hover flies also. You might look up hover flies. Okay. Is that something people just like people buy ladybugs? I have never seen fly. any of those commercially uh, available. Yeah. Well, I've been watching the hornets and wasps come in and eating my grasshoppers. Mm -hmm. They will. And They've got lots of natural enemies, but they. The grasshoppers are outnumbering the natural enemies. Of course, there's a, a scorpion there in the lower right there as well. Hatch in the spring, May and June, sometimes earlier. Overwinter as eggs, late in stars. There's a few species that will overwinter as adult or late. In stars, and occasionally you walk out there in the field in in March, and all of a sudden you see a flying grasshopper. You say, "Whoa! They've hatched and gone through all five stages." No, it was an overwintering adult, and there's generally just two or three species that will be there. Do they then continue their life cycle? Yes. Yes. Okay, George, take over. Yep. So uh, anyway, now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the chemicals that are used uh, or pesticides used.